All right. Sure. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar on all electric heat pumps. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about heat pumps in multifamily units. This discussion, of course, will be led by Tom Jolene. Uh, a few things before we start. Uh, we are going to cover a lot in this discussion, and we are saving some time at the end for questions. Feel free to post any questions you may have during the webinar in Q&A or chat, and we'll get to them at the end. That's my intro, man. Let's get this thing started. Tom, take it away. So for those of you who have um, sat in the other um, heat pump presentations or watched them on the web, first of all, thanks. That's cool. Uh, second is some of, them, some of the material will be repeat very, a little bit, but for the most part, it's new material. So um, uh, the premise behind this is you, you being, let's pretend you're a developer. Odds are you aren't. Uh, we don't specifically call in developers, but we have been talking to some. And the idea would be, hey, let's build um, these apartment complexes, condos, whatever it turns out to be without using gas. And why would we and how could we? Okay, so from the developer's perspective, so we're all going to be insanely financially creative like these developers can be. And first of all, we have to make sure that if there's a first cost implication, um, it whatever the first cost implication is, it has to be offset with labor. It can't be, maybe in the green interest of the world, maybe this heat pump can be a little bit more expensive from a total cost standpoint, but I don't meet very many developers who do things that and choose to pay more. So we got to keep that in mind. Um, one of the benefits of reducing the field labor, and of course we're going to talk about it is, hey, let's get off this project and get into occupancy quicker. There seems to be, I know in all the projects I work on, there seems to be a big push at the end to wrap things up. Um, with furnaces, there's a lot, a little more, there's more parts and pieces at the end that need to be cleaned up. Um, we'll talk about those. Um, these, uh, the heat pumps that we're offering through King Home are higher efficient than the code compliance standards by a pretty good margin. Um, so you may be able to save some operating costs on rooms that are vacant. Um, because we're number four, we're going to reduce maintenance. How? We're going to talk about that a little bit. Quiet is always good. And then finally, um, for those of you who are paying attention to what's going on at the coasts, um, there's a lot of effort uh, being driven in Massachusetts, New York, and California and it'll, uh, as far as decarbonization goes. And so it's coming our way. It may not be tomorrow, it may not be the next day, but uh, at some point, all of our homes are gonna have heat pumps and our multifamily dwellings are gonna have heat pumps and not furnaces. So it's just something to start getting your head wrapped around. Now, from the developer's perspective, we gotta worry about um, risks. What risks do we have? Well, if I lay out a job around heat pumps, it better not cost more. Number two is what are the limitations? So if I build my building differently, what can and can I not do? Um, is it going to fail? Do I need to be concerned about that? And finally, how does it look? Does it look any different than it would look with furnaces? There's also, of course, magic backs, which look, well, they look the way they look. Um, so I think there's a leg up there for heat pumps. All right, so let's start talking about those things. Uh, we're going to save on first cost. Maybe, maybe not. Every project's a little bit different. It depends on the layout of the building. But let's look at some of the things we're going to get rid of. We're going to get rid of that vent. Now, in the case of the picture on the far left, that is a vertical venting that's coming through the roof that appears on the middle picture. Most multifamily apartments vent out the sidewall, which presents, while this looks like a different, difficult kind of a challenge to get all that vent in the chase, venting through the sidewall also has some challenges because you have to line up your penetration when you're laying up the building. And so it's two trips for the contractor to get that vent lined up. Or in retrofits, there may be a soffit built to get the vent out. You have to cover it up because usually the furnace is in the middle of the room and the vent's gonna go out. And if we don't have a space to run the vent, we may have to build a soffit around it, that kind of stuff. Uh, and finally, um, there's gonna be a room somewhere where all those gas meters have to reside. 
and the general contractor and developer have to accommodate that room. Sometimes it's in the parking garage. If there is a parking garage, sometimes there's a separate room. Um, and of course, those gas meters need pipe to run to each furnace or magic pack or whatever that turns out to be. And what does that look like? Now, it's not always so easy to distinguish this when we're bidding it because plumber usually carries gas piping and the HVAC contractor usually carries the vent. If it's combined contractor, great. When we've looked at these projects as heat pumps being alternates, it's been difficult to get the contractors to offer up their true costs because they may already have the job and they're, uh, you know, kids, I blame them. They don't want to give up their profits. So those are one of those things that becomes a challenge if you're not playing on heat pumps on the front end. All right. So uh, the technology that, that these heat pumps have, these cold climate heat pumps, is pretty impressive. So we're competing with a single stage, bang on, bang off, fairly large standard compressor by any of the air conditioning manufacturers you're familiar with, Johns Controls, Train, blah, 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 all those companies. So that's, most of us have that kind of an air conditioner in our home if we have a residence, like a single, uh, single family home. Uh, so for the lion's share of, um, rooms and multifamily, the unit's either going to be 18 seer or 20 seer. So our four ton, three ton units are 18 seer and our two ton is 20 seer. Most apartments get covered by a two ton unit unless it's lead and it's got a lot of outside air or unless it's a really big space or it's uh, multiple stories, that kind of thing. So let's, we're going to spend just a couple minutes on this next slide. So, and we're talking about one specific installation of a, of a heat pump versus a furnace. So if we have, what's the same? The, that we have a vertical air handler um, inside a mechanical closet, inside the apartment or condo. We also set the air-cooled condenser or the heat pump. It's either going to be on the roof. It's going to be on grade. Sometimes it can be on a balcony. There's going to be ductwork inside that um, apartment. We're going to run refrigerant lines from the either outdoor unit or air cooled condensing unit into the furnace to the coil on the top. We got to power it and we have to have some kind of a thermostat. Okay, so that's both systems. So let's assume that all those labor costs are going to be the same. What's going to be different with a furnace? All right, well, first of all, the, the utility companies can install a gas meter. They generally don't charge for the meter that I'm aware of. So let's just be aware that there is some labor by the utility company to put a meter in. Now, we have to run gas piping from the meter to the apartment. Depending on the layout of the building, let's say it's a two-story walk-up, that may not be terribly expensive, but you do have to buy the pipe and you do have to spend the time to run the pipe and get it to where it's supposed to be and land it. So that can be anywhere from looks like 500 bucks uh, to 1200 bucks in labor. And then the copper pipe might be as little as hundred bucks or all the way up to 500 bucks. So somewhere between 600 and $1,700 of gas piping. Now, if the plumber has that included in their bid and we don't have an opportunity to remove that, well, it makes it tough to sell the heat pump. Okay, now for the sheet metal contractor, HVAC contractor, whatever you want to call it, when we have a furnace, we have to run a vent. Now, assuming that we have sidewall vents, which is going to be would be typical for a multi-story, multi-family type of an application, it's a two-trip job. One is to land the flashing at the wall, and then the other one is to get the PVC pipe over there. So that's about four hundred dollars in labor, and this is from. Um, I got some help from a, a, a local contractor who does lots of multifamily installs and he knew these numbers like the back of his hand. So $400 in labor and you gotta run, buy some PVC and get it out there and get a, a termination. So when we put those, just those two pieces together, forget the, the meter, we're over a thousand bucks, sometimes in excess of 2000 bucks. So how close are we gonna be with the heat pump? Now, What's different about the heat pump installation? There's a couple of small things, not much. Number one is that 
our furnace uh, is usually going to be 120 volt um, for just the actual furnace on the inside. The heat pump indoor air handler is 208 volt single phase. So if we know about this in advance, that should be a zero dollar. As we're you know doing things on the fly, if that doesn't get coordinated, there might be a change from the electrician. Also, it is a good idea to have some trim heat. It's not absolutely necessary, but it is a good idea. And if we need an extra breaker for the trim heater, um, that may be a small charge. But again, if this is planned in advance, the electrician should not be charging a lot for these things. So it's really boiling down to the gas pipe and the vent that are the expensive items. And of course, the final termination to the gas by the contract. All right, so now we've got some perspective on how many dollars we're working with. So let's take a look at the different types of methods. Oh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going too fast. On the maintenance end of it. So some developers um, build their buildings and they hold on to them and they take care of the maintenance. Some of them take care of the utility bills. So we've got this furnace. And if you've seen these other presentations, you may be aware that when we use a furnace, we have two systems. We have a full air conditioning system with a coil on the top of the furnace. Then we've got all these little parts that are inside the furnace. So there's a condensate trap, there's a flame sensor, there's an uh, inducer motor, which is takes the products of combustion and pushes them out the vent. So all those pieces that tend to fail because we've all experienced in our homes at some point or another, hey, the furnace is out. Well, the furnace just didn't die. It's one of these parts that failed. Whereas with the picture on the right, the air conditioner and the heating unit are the same thing. So we've, re we've eliminated all these possible points of failure in heating season. Um, and of course we have the same stuff in cooling season. Will it run more? Of course it'll run more. But um, just to be aware. Now, if a lot of the developers and builders I work with periodically run into this issue. Hey, if you're like, if you're in Florida watching this thing, this is not a problem for you. But when we specify higher efficiency furnaces, well, what are we doing to get higher efficiency? We are condensing in the vent on the way out so that water either can run down the building and look like the ice dam that you see in the picture, or it can actually plug up the termination. So I've, you know, had had builders call me up and say, what do you do about this? Well, it's it's an issue. So that issue can go away. First of all, the terminations are gone. Those are not the loveliest terminations I've ever seen. But um, the potential maintenance issue, which requires a crane, um, can be eliminated. Now, for those of you who are paying attention to the climate news, um, and maybe this was in the last webinar too, but um, New York, is banning natural gas in certain certain types, not all, but uh, certain types of multifamily buildings starting at seven stories. So do we expect this to move our way? We do. When, we're not sure, but uh, the trend is gonna be, and with this new administration that we've got, there's gonna be a lot of focus on decarbonization, um, adding new um, renewable energy sources, that kind of stuff. Now, let's remember, and if you've said in this before, you're gonna hear me say it again, what's unique about this compressor is when it gets cold outside, it manages to deal with the cold temperature. Remember, we're boiling refrigerant. Let's, let me slow down just a little bit. We're in heating mode. So where's the heat coming from? The heat's coming from outside the building when the outdoor unit is outside. Of course, we're going to talk about that too. So we're boiling refrigerant with cold temperatures. So as it gets colder and colder, we're going to boil less and less, which is going to cause an issue with our compressor and its compression ratio. So what happens with a lot of the compressors is they shut off at a certain temperature. This one doesn't. Now, I suppose if we took this compressor and we moved it up to the North Pole, it might have some problems. But with our Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota climate, it works just fine. It's uh, tested all the way down to minus 31, and we have test data at minus 22. So we can manage almost everything we've got. Okay, 
Now, let's talk about the configurations of these heat pumps. Um, where does the outdoor unit sit and it makes a difference? So where can it sit? It can sit on grade if you have not a suitable roof to put the unit on. You can put it on the roof. It can be placed on the balcony, which I don't know that it's the developer's first choice to put it on the balcony, but it can be done. And finally, another place that it can go is inside the garage when the garage is heated. It can also be in there when it's not heated, but there's not much benefit to it. So inside the apartment, so those are our outdoor configurations. The indoor unit can be a vertical air handler. It looks a lot like a furnace picture to the right. It can be a multi-zone unit, which doesn't have the sort of central furnace looking thing. It just has like these, you've seen them, the heads that are on the sides mounted on the wall and you put a head in all the rooms that need it. You can do a one-to-one, -one, which means an outdoor unit like the one I'm showing here, and then a wall pack unit. And then you can also use a ducted fan coil. So we're gonna go through all these different configurations specifically for King Home. Now keep in mind, every manufacturer has got a different ball of wax when it comes to heat pumps. When we start, let's talk about, I'll be looking at my left screen so I can actually read the data. Here are some of the competitors uh, to King Home. And there's a lot more than this. Not all of them advertise cold climate, but um, when we look at this grid, um, Sorry about that. Um, heat pumps tend to fall apart, you know, somewhere between four degrees and minus five degrees, something like that. So what does all this mean? Well, let's take a look at um, our carrier base model. The carrier base model, and we went through this in the last presentation. So if you want to get a deeper dive on this, you can go back and look at the, I think it's called a perfect heat pump. So when it's five degrees, a two ton unit, which, you know, King Home produces 24,000 BTUs of heat when it's five degrees outside. The base regular roll, if you go to the website and find a carrier heat pump, it still is heating at five degrees, but it's putting out one third of the capacity. So that's not particularly helpful. And unfortunately our design condition here in Milwaukee is minus 10 or minus 11. So when we get to the minus five and the minus 15, that unit is off. So what does that mean? It means that we need to have a full electric backup to go along with this, this heat pump. Mitsubishi with this particular, now they do have other models, but in this particular configuration with a um, vertical air handler, none of their products, at least as far as I could tell, and I could be wrong, um, none of them operate with these tonnages down to these temperatures. Fujitsu um, has data all the way down to minus 15, which is super cool, but they're, it's hard to read their D-rate schedules because they're on a graph with some shading. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but um, at half capacity, you need a lot of electric backup. And that's the maximum that this Fujitsu can do at minus 15. You can see, you know, what is the, I'm not sure what it means, and it would be the kind of question if you wanna work with Fujitsu say, can you explain the chart to me? Because this is off their published data. LG actually has some pretty good output at gold climate, so good for LG. Um, almost a direct match at five degrees. Um, almost a direct match here. They test at minus four, we test at minus five. Um, they will produce almost as much capacity at minus 13, but then their unit shuts off. Um, their data says heating capacity um, from something like 60, 70 degrees all the way down to minus 13. At minus 13, it's off. So what do, is that gonna work? Well, it depends on how much belt and suspenders you wanna wear for your project. If you're in Chicago, hey, this is probably fine. Your design temperature is minus eight, minus 10. This should be good enough. Wisconsin, I don't know. We're rolling the dice. If we go up to Green Bay or Madison, it's trickier. And then as we get into the bigger units, they don't perform quite as well. So there's lots and lots and lots of iterations of heat pumps. It's one of these things where I want you to be careful when you hear 
and the heat pump's still working at minus 13. How well is it working at minus 13 is the bigger question. And we've covered that before in other seminars, but I wanna make sure that, that uh, if any developers are watching, what does that mean? It means, hey, when we have that polar vortex, you got no heat. And are you gonna to need to design a full electric backup? And how is that gonna affect how your building electrical is gonna work? Okay, so we've beaten this fairly well to death. We're gonna keep moving on. Okay, again, here's, now first it was uh, King Home configurations of heat pumps. They can do all the things that we can do. If it's on grade, on roof, or on balcony, they may need a full electric backup. And that's the thing that we're trying desperately to avoid. Now, um, this is a picture of a project, a multifamily project. If this is your project, hey, it was, I stole it. <laughs> um, we're hoping to um, uh, take a run at this one. But the purpose, this is a, first of all, it's a really cool looking building and you can see all the unique challenges of getting um, utility into each one of these apartments, right? So we can put units on the roof, but we have to be careful with how far vertically we can go with our heat pump refrigerant lines. We can, oops, sorry about that. We can put the unit in, I assume the garage is heated. It may or may not be, I'm not sure, but I like to assume it is. So we can put heat pumps in the garage and run the refrigerant lines up. We could put some of the units on the balcony. And then we have very short runs into um, into the rooms. And finally, we can put some of the units on grade and hopefully hide them. This would be a tricky one to hide them on, but you guys get the idea. There's different places to locate the outdoor units and there are different configurations of the indoor units. So we're gonna go through these at a medium pace, I'd say. So configuration one is the one that I talk about the most, which is this, this is more, of a, more than anything, a direct replacement for a furnace. So you can see the little guy on the left is either two or three tons. You can see the electrical on it, very similar to a standard air-cooled condensing unit. Uh, in the middle, if it's a larger property or larger, larger individual rooms, go up to four and really four and a half tons in heating. So the electrical demand is higher. And then inside the apartments, we have two to five ton indoor vertical air handlers. And I've put, what I've put here is some trim heat, okay? They do not have to have trim heat. I'm gonna talk about it just a little bit at the end. Here's your electrical that would be different than what we're doing with the furnace. So if your electrician is gonna say, hey, I need to charge you for this extra circuit or whatever, this is the size of them. So it's not awful. It's not very, very big. Okay. So a few things about dimensions and refrigerant runs. King Home does not have the longest refrigerant runs in the world. Most of them are 49 feet. The indoor unit, you know, not even two by two by four. There's enough room in that closet to put the water heater. Um, you can put the water heater below or above. Um, will it be tight? Yes, it will be tight. Uh, the four and five ton unit is a little bit taller. The outdoor unit is fairly small. Um, I've got the sound here. Uh, for reference, a standard air conditioner is 68 decibels dBA. Um, our heat pumps are quite a bit quieter. And here's the sear ratings. So this is our putting our, our outdoor unit actually outdoors. Okay. Now, this compressor that I talked about a handful of slides ago, this, this here compressor is applied in other products. So. Um, this compressor sitting inside here has a multi-zone. So instead of one set of refrigerant lines, it will have multiple. So it's something to consider that if you're running um, from the roof to the first floor and it's a five-story building, that's a lot of refrigerant lines, right? But you don't need a mechanical closet, at least not for the, the vertical air hand. So this unit is capable of doing all the same stuff that uh, the Central Station did, the air handler, um, but it's got these wall pack units. It can also have little fan coils, you can have units on the floor, that kind of thing. So as, this is actually kind of a cool little 
GIF, where for different configurations of apartment, you just locate, you can kind of see over here, the sidewall units in each space, right? So multi-zone, you put a wall unit in every zone or fan coil or however that, so it's a very flexible configuration. So we have a one and a half, a two ton, a three and a three and a half ton and a four ton. They're extremely efficient. They're more efficient than the Ultranix, which is 20 or 18s here. These are, uh, because of the diversity in the system, they become very efficient. A little bit louder. The small units have a very short run for refrigerant lines. Uh, as we get to the three and three and a half and the four ton, they're a lot longer. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then the larger the tonnage, the more indoor units that you can apply. So you can apply this to um, a two-story walk-up just as easily as you can apply it to a multifamily building. So again, the indoor unit types, a wall unit, a ducted fan coil, something you put in the ceiling or something you put down low, something that you can use to get the heat and the cooling into the spaces where space is available because those apartments and condos are packed pretty tight. All right, now, again, same compressor, sorry, not in the indoor unit, in the outdoor unit, an ultra heat um, compressor in this one-to-one -one configuration. We're not gonna see a lot of these unless we're building studios, right? But it could be that we put lots of little units on the roof or on grade and pipe to this single wall unit for a studio with a single bedroom or something. So the size is available, three quarter and one ton, one and a half ton, um, okay vertical refrigerant runs. So in the case of like a four story, you might have to put some outer units on the roof, some on grade, but um, small, small and fairly quiet, very quiet. And then there's a second model that's even more efficient. These were a 30, 23, 21. These um, more efficient yet in larger sizes and much, much larger um, vertical run capacities. So it's just basically the same thing, um, same compressor, just a different rating system for them. So that's all the different configurations that we can do with the unit outdoors. Now, what can we do with the units, the outdoor unit in a heated garage? Well, let's just think about that for a second. What are, why are we putting it in the heated garage? Well, we know that heat pumps work just fine down in Florida and Texas, well, Texas, if it doesn't freeze. The heat pump starts to derate at 47 degrees or so. A heated parking garage is gonna be maintained at around 47 degrees, maybe a little bit warmer, maybe a little bit colder, but it's really not going to derate. So that opens up some of the configurations to different and standard models that we offer, competitors offer. So this first configuration is called, I think kind of a lousy name, it's called U-Match. So the outdoor unit sitting in the garage, propped up maybe over the you know, parked cars or against the wall with a guardrail against it. Then we've got, a fan, excuse me, a fan coil instead of a vertical air hand. Uh, these fan coils do have a decent amount of static, uh, but they are um, a little unwieldy when it comes to size. So this is our U-match lineup. So the outdoor unit is in the heated garage. These are not as efficient as the ultra heat compressors, but they're still more efficient than your standard stuff. They are fairly quiet. I don't know that you really need to worry about it because they're in the heated garage. If we're worried about sound in the heated garage, you got other challenges. The vertical distance is acceptable for four or five stories. The um, outdoor unit dimension, they get to be pretty tall. This, you know, uh, four and a half feet tall, if that's gonna be over a car, it, it might be a little bit tight. Uh, and then the fan coils also get to be fairly large. I kind of wonder if these are, you know, this like, a seven foot fan coil is what it says in the catalog. I I'm, would validate that if we run into an application like this. Now, a couple things that we didn't talk about. In the wintertime, 
we're going to be moving heat um, from the garage into the apartments. So that's going to leave our garage even colder. So if we have heat in the garage, we're going to need more heat because we're going to be um, extracting the heat from the heated garage from if it's gas fired unit heaters or if it's some kind of an electric heating system, whatever that may be, we're still going to be rejecting not rejecting cold but pulling heat from it. So we have to make up that heat with the heating system that we have. In the summertime, the outdoor units are going to condense. So below each of those heat pumps, which you're thinking, oh, this is going to be really easy, we're going to have condensate dripping down. So we can't either, if we have them over parked cars, we have to build trays to catch the water and then run the water somewhere else, or we can't have them over the cars. So those garages are pretty tight. So it's something to keep in mind, not only for this U-match type unit, but for all the units when we put them in the park garage. Okay, so big fan coils. We'll double check that at some point, but that's what I got out of the book. All right, we can also, we talked about a multi-zone unit. We can do the same configuration, that multi-zone unit, um, and put the unit in the garage. So we don't need a specialty compressor, specialty unit. We can just take the unit, put in the garage and do the same kind of thing. Very similar types of configurations. The efficiency is the same as that you match, so 16, 16, 18. It's reasonably quiet, and again, kind of who cares? The vertical runs, somewhat limited, not bad. Um, as the unit sizes go up, the number of units available go up. Um, man, in this, like this five, four and a half ton, you can get nine indoor units. That's a lot of refrigerant piping. Each one of those is a home run. It's not like a VRF system where we have a big pipe and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We've got an individual home run to each one. So that's a lot of line sets or copper piping. So maybe not the cheapest route to go, but it's an option. Okay. Now, again, we talked about single head units. So you could put a one-to-one -one with the outdoor unit in the garage. Now this is a less expensive still reasonably efficient one-to-one -one heat pump configuration. It's still 18 sear. It's still extremely quiet. It's got actually a little bit more vertical run capability and the outdoor unit is pretty small. Finally, um, the, if the goal is to reduce carbon footprint, actually the dual fuel configuration is the best. So you would buy a furnace, whoever you is, the contractor, the developer, there's a furnace and we use the heat pump A coil and furnish that with the outdoor unit. So Lennox furnace, train furnace, carrier, whoever is furnace. We don't sell furnaces. We could, but we're not super competitive at it. Um, it's not really part of our offer. When it gets cold outside, it is more carbon conscious actually to burn natural gas, not propane, not oil, but natural gas, yes. Um, <coughs> in the coldest climates until our grid gets to be um, almost entirely based on renewables. So in this next slide, you can see the outdoor unit, or well, it's spelled wrong, Altranix is capable of being furnished with a King Home indoor air handler or a gas furnace with a King Home coil that's situated on the top. This still can be run with a standard heat pump thermostat and away we go. Um, my second to last, third to last slide, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, I wanna address risk. And we've got this issue of defrost cycle. Now, what does that mean? Well, we've got, we're trying to boil refrigerant in cold temperatures. So when it's really, really cold, when it's minus five outside, how much moisture is in the air? Almost none. So the defrost cycle doesn't really happen when it's really, really cold. This is a picture of an install we have north of Milwaukee and the owner called me up. He's like, hey, this is going on. I'm like, that's normal. That's supposed to happen. So when we have some moisture in the air, it is going to freeze on top of the coils. 
So what does that mean? It means the output of the heat pump is gonna be derating as long as there's frost on the heat pump, on the outdoor coil. So what has to happen in order to get that frost off is the heat pump runs in reverse for, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of minutes. So we're pushing heat into the coil outside and we're melting that ice off the coil. So we're losing our heating capacity for a few moments. That's why it's a good idea to have a trim heater. If it's really balmy, we're gonna be forming ice a lot. It doesn't matter whose heat pump it is. This is just what, physics, right? We've got moisture outside and we've got a cold surface and it's gonna freeze. So that trim heater is there not, should not be there to back up the whole system. But in the few moments over the course of a winter where we're gonna have frost, the trim heater can help us out. Is it absolutely necessary? It is not. Um, is it a creature comfort kind of a thing? It is. Okay, last slide before the thank you is here's some rough. Now there are rough, rough costs. Um, I hear from contractors that do multifamily facilities that they can get into a furnace and air conditioner for about this price. Now this is the, this is the, what is it? Non big name brands, the off brand, um, you know, it's not the, it's the cheapest thing they got with, it's basically um, a major brand with a different sticker on it and a different supply chain, right? So they can get into a unit at 1800. Well, this first one, which is a direct replacement is a couple grand more, but we have this labor savings opportunity plus all those other benefits along the way. So is it in the realm of possibility? Yeah, absolutely it is. Depends on the building, right? Uh, depends on how many units, depends on all sorts of stuff, but we're in the ballpark. Now, this ultra heat multi-zone, it's a little more expensive, but if you're retrofitting a building that doesn't have any, any ductwork existing or the ability to run ductwork, well, I think you're really barking up a good tree here where you're adding air conditioning when you couldn't do it before. Okay. And finally, this one-to-one -one unit is pretty economical, but again, it's just a single zone. As we go to the units, so the U-Match, the standard multi-zone, the Lilac, those are all with the outdoor unit in the heated garage. No heated garage, can't use these, at least not for heating. Okay, so they're less expensive than their ultra heat, I guess, competitors, right? Um, that multi-zone 3,900 versus 4,850. Um, and again, the 1,500 versus 2,400 or whatever that turns out to be. Yeah, they're number one, they're less efficient. Number two, you can't place the outdoor unit outdoors. Uh, dual fuel, which is sort of the, as far as I'm concerned, that would be the Cadillac because carbon footprint, yes, risk way down. Um, that's comparable to our um, ultra heat system. So look, the prices are all gonna change. If all of a sudden the ports become free, and it isn't 20 grand to get a shipping container out of China anymore, um, these numbers are subject to change. Uh, if we get more, so if we get more uh, distribution uh, inventory here, um, you know, all these numbers are, have the potential to change. But for a starting point, there's something to talk about. And there's a lot of upside for the developer to con consider uh, an all electric cold climate heat pump for their multifamily buildings. And, as pressure mounts from, you know, I would say our progressive communities and in Minneapolis is extremely progressive, uh, Madison and Dane County, extremely progressive, and Michigan, Ann Arbor, very progressive. There is a lot of demand for folks to go all electric. Now, please, all, the all electric people, let's remember that we have to couple this with renewables in order to be effective. If we're using utility from the power plants, we're going backwards to a certain extent. We need to either have dual fuel or we need to have renewables on the grid um, and preferably both. So for now, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, and we've got about 20 minutes for 
questions. And yes. thanks a lot for putting up with my long <laughs> one-sided speech here. Well, thank you very much, Tom. That was a lot in 40 minutes. And we do have a few questions. I'm going to read them in, or, in the order that we received them. Sure. Um, the first one is about the units themselves. Um, yeah. Can you hang them on the side of a building? I have a picture in a previous presentation, and I could, I'll pull that up at the very end. But yeah, you could use um, an anchor and a couple of pieces of Unistrut and support it that way. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention, uh, this Ultranix unit specifically, well, actually all the ultra heat units, don't have a, um, uh, uh, what's the phrase? Uh, um, a lot of the cold climate heat pumps by competitors have a, God, I can't remember the phrase. It's a, basically an electric heater in a pan um, that goes underneath the unit. We don't need that. Um, but yes, it can be supported off the side of a building with adequate support. So yes. Okay. All right. So yeah, and it, it's kind of funny that you you say that. I nobody needs to know this about me, but I watch a lot of um, Korean television, and you oh. see like the sides of buildings, and they yeah. just have heat pumps going all the way up. Yep. 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 Yeah. True. All right. So the next question is the 49 foot, a single pipe run or totally connected length, especially with multiple heads. That is a vertical limit. So for multi zones, for example, the, the total connected limit will be much greater than that. Um, a few hundred feet. So um, it changes with each heat pump, whether the heat pump is an ultra heat or a standard multi zone. Um, and yeah, and the size. So for a certain application, it's one of those things like, let's look. Um, all we have to do is take a look at the run and figure out if we can meet the vertical and the toll. Okay. Uh, so uh, what, uh, we have a few more questions here. Uh, again, reminder to everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, you can post it in the chat or click Q and A and post it there. We'll get to them. Either way, uh, so let's see. When in a heated garage, how is the garage heated? Are we just adding heat, taking it away, then heating again? Isn't that approach using electric resistance, heat negating the COP advantage offered by the heat pump? That is an awesome question. And I look at this like, the towards the end, I recommend dual fuel for these heat pumps. Now, someday I'm not going to recommend dual fuel because the grid's going to be a lot cleaner. But right now, um, when it gets to be, you know, when the COP on the heat pump drops, we are more what environmentally environmentally friendly when we use natural gas on the low end. So I look at this like, okay, the developer is going to put gas in the garage. Is that a bad thing? Not really because he's increased the COP and the efficiency of all these heat pumps by doing that with sort of a minimum amount of carbon impact. So he's only using the gas at the very, very cold end. Compare that to a traditional furnace, which burns gas as soon as it's 60 or 55 degrees all the way through the heating season. So that garage um, is sort of operating like a dual fuel kind of a system. So it's not bad. Um, I hear mixed reviews about the outdoor units being in the garages. So, you know, it's a trade-off. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So we got one more here. How many minutes or seconds does the defrost cycle operate? If only seconds, the indoor fan could, the indoor fan could operate on low, and maybe no one would notice the cold air for those seconds. It's a great question. I have seen a video of a King Home uh, Gree manufactured unit in defrost mode that's pretty quick. It's like two minutes. I would imagine that that's a pretty variable kind of thing. Here's why. Mm -hmm. um, if it's misting, there's always moisture in the air versus if it rained and it stopped. So there's so much variability in how fast that ice is going to form. 
Um, what what I can, so, so the answer is, I don't know. That's the truth of the matter is, I don't know. AHRI does not rate defrost cycles for heat pumps. And we don't get a lot of great data. So it's we're kind of learning about the defrost cycle as we get more installations. So the picture I show in the presentation, which is that, right? So you notice that it's kind of coming out in strips. So part of the coil has frosted and part of the coil has not frosted. Here's where the heat transfer is taking place. If you're seeing my mouse, I'm not sure if you are. And here there's less heat transfer because the refrigerant is already boiled off in its change state. So there's a lot of um, what's the demand in the home, how much refrigerant is being boiled, all that stuff affects how this defrost cycle works. So, and one thing that King Home and Greed do that's really cool is they break the circuitry up for their outdoor unit. So instead of having like one big coil, they have like four. So if you're gonna imagine you wanna boil water on your stove, one thing you could do would be put a big pot on the stove, turn on the gas on full and wait for it to boil. Or if you wanted to go faster and you have four burners, you divide that mass of water by four, turn the four burners on and it'll boil faster. So that's kind of what they're accomplishing. That's what they're using as their technique to uh, improve the speed of the defrost cycle. Maybe other suppliers do that. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. That's how King Kong gets their stuff. Okay. All right. Well, we had another question come in here. Uh, let's assume that you install multiple outdoor heat pump units on the wall brackets. Won't yeah. there be ice buildup? Won't there be? Uh, as those units defrost and the frost buildup on the outdoor coils. Uh, have, there's, a, there's also an apology for the bad typing and spelling. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. That was really funny. Um, but yes, is, what, about, what about the ice buildup on that? That's a, good, that's a fair question. So when um, heat pumps get installed, like when, you, when you buy an air conditioner, you just put it on a concrete slab. Why can you get away with that? Because it's never heating. There's never any ice buildup. When we get um, a heat pump used for heating, there is a minimum height recommendation for that unit to be off the ground because water is going to drip off the face. As long as we're in accordance with that height restriction, or we're above the height, we're good. There's no, there won't be like a warranty issue of like you didn't mount it high enough. Um, but if you're, I'm picturing, here's your heat pump, you know, kind of the narrow way, we're going to have two pieces of Unistrut or if you're using uh, Gripple aluminum, whatever it turns out to be, it's going to sit on there. The water is going to drip off onto grade. I hope that answers the question. All right. Well, since we have no more questions here, I think we can give you guys 10 minutes of your time back. Uh, thank you guys for attending. Remember, you can find out more information at allseasonheatpump.com or Tom, what's the other website again? Um, just airflowreps.com. Airflowreps.com. All right. Thank you everyone for attending today. Take care and stay warm. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Bye.